Hello and welcome to the Southern Duchess Cooperative Parish uh, Good Friday service. Uh, this is a joint effort among our member churches to create an opportunity for some meditation and reflection, especially on, on the love that Christ poured out on us through the cross of Calvary. Uh, this is a time for us to be together in, in a different way and, and to share virtual space so that we can turn our hearts and our minds towards Christ and be moved again by the immensity of God's grace that we know in him. Uh, we, we welcome you and we, we invite you to join us as we worship in spirit and truth together uh, as we hear the seven last words of Christ. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, graciously behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading this eve today uh, comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 1 through 5, and that will be read for us by Pastor Darlene. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him off of no account. Surely he has borne our inflictions, our infirmities, and carried out diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Thanks be to God. We are fortunate to have uh, music brought to us from a, a variety of folks uh, for this service. This first song is going to be the song, Were You There?, and is going to be uh, provided for us by Heidi Tucci of the Trinity LaGrangeville Church.
And now we join in hearing the seven last words of Jesus. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to be in reflection together, to really think deeply about the message that Christ sends us with these final words of his life. Uh, our, our pastors are going to take turns sharing just a, a, a few moment, a few moments of thoughts about uh, what what these scriptures bring up in their hearts. Uh, we invite you to listen and and to reflect your, yourself. In between each of the seven last words, we're going to hear another verse of he never said a mumbling word. And again, that's going to be brought to us by Heidi Tucci of the Trinity LaGrangeville Church. Our first uh, first final word of Christ this for this service is from Luke chapter 23, verse 34, and is brought to us by Pastor Micah. Good evening, or good morning, good afternoon, whatever time it may be when you are watching this. As Jody said, I will read first from Luke 23, verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. In my Bible, these words of Jesus's are encased in, in brackets. And next to those brackets is a footnote that says, other ancient authorities lack this sentence. And what they mean by that is that in some of our earliest manuscripts we have of Luke, Jesus doesn't say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In some other early manuscripts of Luke, he does. And what's more, Mark, Matthew, and John don't mention Jesus saying this either. Only Luke and only in some versions. We might wonder then, did Jesus actually say the words, or did someone else add them later? And further, if he did or didn't say these words, how much does that matter? Do we say it matters a lot because they testify to how strongly or, or weakly Jesus believed his own preaching when he said to love our enemies? Or do we believe that we've already seen enough of Jesus to know how strongly he believed in love and forgiveness? Whether or not Jesus actually said these words, we might reason, they are a truthful reflection of how he would have felt. How much do the last words and actions of our lives matter? Are they no different than anything we say or do at any other point in our life? or do they carry extra weight? Do they reveal something truer about ourselves, testing the strength of our convictions? Can a good word spoken on a deathbed or a selfless deed done in dying make up for years of bad behavior? Can a moment of cowardice before dying undo years of righteous living? Tonight, we might consider, do the last words of Jesus reveal anything new about who he was, or do they simply emphasize and drive home what we already knew before? Are they the punctuation on the long sentence of his life? And if so, what punctuation mark is it? An exclamation point? A question mark? Or perhaps a comma? before something more.
our second final word for this service comes to us by Pastor Kathy. As the second passage, Luke 23, verse 43, I'm going to start just slightly earlier on verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged uh, kept deriding Jesus and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now this goes to show us that this person knew who Jesus was. He knew that Jesus could have saved himself and yet that Jesus was giving himself up for us. So when Jesus tells him, surely you will be with me in paradise, we know that all those who truly believe can enter the kingdom of heaven and that this, this man hanging next to Jesus had the faith. He knew that Jesus was a savior and Jesus promised him, you will be with me. You will enter the kingdom. comes to us from Pastor Darlene. I'm reading this afternoon from John chapter 19, verses 26 through 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he, Jesus, spoke to the disciple and said, here, is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. These verses can bring us to a very human level. We recall from so many readings in the scriptures that Jesus is truly 100% divine, 
God, as well as 100% human being born of Mary. We know that through his entire life, he felt the pain, the agony, the joys of growing and companionship. But he also knows the need of being together, of relationships. And at this time, he is, he is already experiencing unbelievable pain, the torture of it all, the mental, the, the physical torture. He's just totally enwrapped in this agony. And yet he has the ability to continue a focus of sharing God's love. Thinking back a moment ago to our reading about how Jesus spoke to the, 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 the prisoners beside him who were also being crucified, the one who showed belief. Jesus said he would see him in paradise. He had enough care to say that. He was thinking of someone else's eternal salvation. And then through his blood, sweat stained eyes, he somehow focused on his mother. If we could take a moment to think what it would be like to see our own mothers, fathers, family, when we're ready to die and our, our life, our memories flash before us and we remember the care they've given us. And we know now what is ahead of them. The fact that Jesus was able to continue to care for others, including his mother and his favorite, his beloved disciple, he connected them in a way that would be a care and love and compassion for Mary. As we go through our own pain and suffering in these days ahead and the need for hope, let us all remember that Jesus is with us. He loves us. He knows what it's like to be human. He knows the extreme pain of death for us. And he knows the joy of resurrection. Let us hold on to that belief and that hope when our days and nights are dark, knowing that his love and compassion is always and always will be with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. I have to share with you comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cries out in pain. He's anguished, and he uses the language of the region, Aramaic, to express this emotion. He's feeling pain. He's feeling abandoned by his father God, as he not only is bearing up against this horrible pain of death, but also carrying the weight of the sin of the world on that cross. He was the Lamb of God, the Agnus Dei. That term actually was invented by John the Baptist, as we can see him quoted in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 29, when John saw Jesus the day after baptizing him on the Jordan, he pointed and said, 
look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What a huge weight. The sin of the world on the broken body of a man being executed. What unbelievable pain to bear. What we hear from Jesus' own lips in this verse, he's actually quoting David from the Old Testament. If you read the beginning of Psalm 22, you, you read these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? so far from the words of my groaning. Jesus' apostles, the gospel writers in particular, recognize that Christ, even in his agony, is saying words that he studied in the Old Testament. That these words and the entire passion and sacrifice of Jesus Christ is a cry of an righteous sufferer, the same as quoted by David in Psalm 22. For them, it coalesced the understanding that Christ's suffering and death upon the cross relieves the pain of all righteous suffering sinners and saves them for life eternal. May it be so. His blood came trickling down and he never said word of Jesus comes to us from Pastor Juhe. Last word from Jesus from John 19, verse 28. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. As I read this scripture, I just imagine myself sitting under the cross where Jesus was crucifying and saying this last word. I am thirsty. So I just want to share with you my reflection, personal conversation, or my com personal confession to Jesus. So as I share this one, I just invite you, just imagine yourself. You are also under the cross where Jesus is crucifying and saying his last word, I'm thirsty.
when I was thirsty for the truth, Jesus, you invited me to come to you with the words. If anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever drinks the water that I will give shall never thirst. So I came to you and my thirst soul was quenched by your love and with your living water. So thank you. Thank you for your living water and quenching my thirst. Now I'm sitting under the cross and hear your voice. I am thirsty. You gave me a new life and quenched my thirst, thirst with your living water. But Jesus, all that I have now is a little water in my cupped hand. So little that I don't think my water is not good enough to quench your thirst. But I humbly bring my cupped hand holding water to you and moisten your dry lips. Please take my water, my Lord, my Jesus. He hung his head and died, and he never said a mumbling word. He hung his head and died. word of Jesus from John chapter 19 verse 30 when ye had received the drink Jesus said it is finished with that he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit this sixth last word of Jesus it is finished invite some questions in my mind. In particular, what is the it in this sentence? What is finished? Uh, is it his work here on earth? And, and if so, what work? Because he did so much. Was it his teaching ministry? Was it his healing ministry? Was it his social justice ministry? He, he had given the world so much. Or, or maybe the it in this sentence is the suffering that he had just endured. The agony, the ridicule, the, the lies and the deceit and, and the accusations that had been hurled at him unjustly, the inhumane treatment. Maybe, maybe he's just relieved that that's over, that the end of his suffering is in sight. The, the it could be so many things. John Wesley called the it in this sentence the purchase of man's redemption. A transaction whereby the debt that has been amassed by human sin is discharged in one act of completely selfless love. And, and that, that's something that's hard for us to comprehend. That's something for us to that's difficult for us to even begin to wrap our minds around, let alone our hearts, to, to embrace it 
and to allow ourselves to become the beneficiaries of, of that amazing gift. Good Friday is a mixture of grief and grace. These words, it is finished, lend an air of finality to this moment. There's something which becomes complete in Christ's self-giving love. Today, may these words speak to your heart and may they grant you an assurance that what Christ has done in your life has been done fully and completely. The purchase of your redemption. They crucified my seventh last word of Jesus and after this is read uh, we'll, we'll have a moment for you to offer your own reflection uh, to, to just uh, hit pause on this video and take as long as you need to take in what you've just heard from from the pastors of our cooperative parish or what you hear speaking in your own heart today the seventh word from Luke Chapter 23, verse 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. Would you now join me in a prayer for our world? Almighty God, whose cascading love stops at nothing to rain down upon us, we lift our hearts to you. We come in brokenness and in need. We come aware of the brokenness and need around us. Hear us, and more than that, be close to us, we pray. We lift our prayers for those who are heartbroken and in need of hope. For those suffering the pangs of division, longing for connection and unity. For those suffering oppression and longing for justice. For those in turmoil and longing for peace, especially we think of those in Ukraine. We pray for those who are hurting and desperate for healing. Touch their lives this day by the grace which is made known to us in Jesus Christ. May the darkness of the shadow which the cross casts over this world Deepen our awareness of the depths of your great love. And may it become a pathway to the sunrise of a new day, a new hope, a new way forward together. Almighty and gracious God, hear now the prayers of your people, the very longings of our heart. And remember us in your kingdom as we pray together the prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. Our closing song today is number 292 in the Methodist hymnal, though the lyrics are going to be on the screen for you. It's brought to us by Art Labriola. What wondrous love is this? At this point, I'd like to invite Pastor Micah to come and offer our closing prayer for the service. May Jesus Christ, who for our sake became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, keep you and strengthen you, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>